to us, he come up here and opened his Bible and said, turn to Romans chapter 12, and every bit of the color left my face. And I began to sweat profusely and begin to pray, Lord, it would be a good time, just like Zechariah, to make a man mute. <laughs> and then, then I would come up with some strange reason as to tell the congregation what happened, but God didn't do that, and I, I, I believe in the sovereignty and will of God. Just living proof, I've never told a man what to preach or never asked a man to preach. I just call whatever man God puts on my heart and have him come, even if it means he may open the Bible to the very place I'm going to be at for the next hour. And so we do trust the Lord. I believe in sovereignty. Because of that this morning, I believe God wanted our church to get a double-barrel message of the same exact two verses of Scripture. And uh, because of that today, I praise the Lord. I'm thankful, looking forward to all God's got to say to us. We're in Romans chapter 12. Just for the sake of, I guess you could say, habit. I'll read these two verses again. Romans 12, 1, the Bible says this. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Then he'll tell you what will prevent it from happening. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm going to say this this morning before we try to pray and preach with the help of the Lord. That phrase that shows up in the second verse, will of God, means this is something ever legitimate Christian should sit on the edge of their seat and perk their ears up about. Because right, right. this isn't for some people. Right. This is for every believer. Hey. And if what I'm going to preach to you this morning, don't light your fire, don't move your thermometer at all, you got a lot to be worried about. Yes, on your best day, you're probably just cold and callous and indifferent. You need to fix that. But if you're anywhere close to where you need to be, we're preaching about the will of God, it ought to interest you. Now, from this text this morning, I've simply titled this morning's message this, Waving the White Flag of Surrender. Waving the White Flag of Surrender, because that is exactly what he's asking you and I to do. Some people believe that when it comes to salvation, God makes a decision for you. I don't. I believe you get the truth of the gospel and you respond in faith. That's what I believe the Bible teaches. And just as much as it requires a responding to the gospel to be saved, in your Christian life, you will have to respond in truth to what you hear along the way. And what God, the will of God for every born again child of God is to wave a flag of surrender. Your flesh will want to fight this process all the way to your dying day. And unless you wave the white flag of surrender, you'll miss out on everything God's got for you in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So the plea to the church is this. Wave the white flag of surrender. Stop the fight. Let the battle end today. Let today be the day where you say, Lord, those issues and areas I've been fighting you about for a while, I'm done. I'm not going to win. There's no reason to try anymore. I'm just going to wave my flag and say, Lord... Not die with my will, but thine be done. Amen. Can I tell you this, child of God? Your Christian life is lived a whole lot better when you wave the white flag. You'll enjoy the blessings of God. You'll enjoy the presence of God. You'll experience the transformation of God when you wave the white flag. And that's what Paul's pleased about this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather again with your people to be able to open the precious word of God. And Lord, today our hearts are stirred because we believe you are no doubt speaking to the Lighthouse Baptist Church. Lord, I pray this morning you would use me as a vessel to be your servant during this hour. And I ask you, God, to do a great work in our heart and life for one reason and one reason only, that we may glorify you. Have your, your way in this service. Speak to our hearts and we'll give you the glory for it all. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen and amen. We've been preaching through the book of Romans now on Sunday morning for quite a while. And up to this point in Romans, of course, the first 11 chapters being what I'm referring to, Paul has been dealing with some very strong 
doctrinal teaching. Brother Mason alluded to that a little earlier, but just to refresh our memories, chapters 1 through 5, Paul was dealing with the subject matter of salvation. In chapters 6, 7, and 8, he was dealing with sanctification. And then in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he was dealing with the promised seed or the, the nation of Israel, the people of God that were under the Abrahamic covenant. We now get to chapter number 12, and I will say this, that this book is taking its last and final turn, starting here in chapter number 12. The rest of the book actually deals with how the previous doctrines that have been preached about or explained to us should be lived out in a daily and practical manner. We're going to get a lot of, I guess you could say, nuts and bolts instruction in chapters 12 through chapter 16 of the book of Romans. But before we can get into any of that, the Apostle Paul lays down this vitally important truth in verses 1 and 2 of chapter number 12 of the book of Romans. And what the Apostle Paul is talking about or dealing with there makes the rest of the book possible. Paul's going to ask some very, very strong things of us in the rest of this book. There are going to be some challenges that are going to come to our heart about living a Christian life. It's going to be a sacrificial living. It's going to be a put others before yourself living. And unless you and I have a Romans 12, 1 and 2 experience, you'll be overwhelmed with what Paul asks of you. It'll seem like an impossible mountain to climb. But can I say this for the child of God? Whenever you wave the white flag of surrender, you get to actually live out whenever Jesus says this to you and I in the Gospels. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. The Christian life is not hard to live if you're living it in the power of the Spirit of God. However... If you're trying to have the best of both worlds, if you're fighting the Lord, wanting your cake, amen, of, of, of eternity, and then you're, you're, uh, you're, you're being able to eat it too, being in, living in the flesh, you're going to have a difficult journey along the way. And so the Apostle Paul basically dives in about showing us that if you and I are willingly surrendered to the will of God for our life, it will be no doubt a, a, an area we can navigate with the help of the Lord. He starts off here with what I call a threefold invitation. Notice here in the first part of verse number one, in one phrase, or he makes this statement. First of all, there is a plea in the invitation. He says, I beseech you therefore. That word beseech, if you're taking notes, simply means to invite or to invoke. That is an invitation for you and I. Listen to me now. It's an invitation to participate but he's doing it with somewhat of an urging. He says, I, I beseech you therefore, brethren. In other words, he is saying this, look, I'm going to tell you what you ought to do. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. I'm going to tell you what you'll benefit from doing, but I'm not going to make you do it. And God ain't going to make us do it. But it is in our best interest to comply. It's like you parents, you understand as you're raising your children and uh, their little minds are forming and growing and sometimes their body outgrows their minds and sometimes uh, what they think about life and you're trying to guide them along the way and mold them and a lot of times what you're telling them don't always sit well with them, they don't always understand it. But in the back of your mind as a parent, you're thinking, or you're telling them, I know I do, if you'll just listen to me and trust me, you're going to come out a lot better than I did. Because I wouldn't listen and I did not trust and therefore I learned unnecessary lessons the hard way. Can I say that's how God works with His children. He gives us what we need to know. And if you and I will just listen and if we'll just trust Him, God knows what we need more than we understand or know it ourselves. I keep saying this, but man, you ain't got to become an example or an illustration in a sermon. Bibles replete with people who thought they knew more than God. Every time somebody done something contrary to the Scriptures, and you can start in the book of Genesis and find it all the way to Revelation, and, and mankind has got that as part of his human flaw. We know so much until life smacks us in the face. So we see there is a plea in the invitation. Then we see also the people for the invitation. He makes it clear in verse number 1 of Romans 12. He says he's addressing brethren. That means that plea is directed towards saved people. Why is he addressing, addressing brethren? I'll tell you why he's addressing saved people for. Because God isn't asking an unsaved person to conform to anything. The answer for the unsaved is not confirmation. Listen, a lost, for a lost person, God desires salvation, not confirmation. God's desire for somebody that's not saved is not just that they start going to church, not just that they cut out the bad things in their life. That would just be conforming to something. But listen to me this morning. Confirmation without salvation is nothing but imitation. God doesn't want humanity to have imitation. God wants humanity to experience a transformation. And that transformation only comes when you walk into that relationship with Jesus Christ at salvation. 
Jesus did not die on Calvary for man to live a lie of imitation. He wants him to experience that legitimate transformation. It's catching the fish first, not cleaning it first. Amen. I want to make sure I do a good job as a preacher not being as concerned about the cleaning of the fish as I am about first making sure the fish have been caught. Amen. Amen. You, don't, you don't get them in the boat. You don't, you don't clean them in the water. you got to catch them. you got to get them in the boat first before you clean them fish, right? By the way, can I say this? This morning, a healthy church should not look like a museum of Christian artifacts full of cookie-cutter Christians. Amen. A healthy church, listen to me good this morning, I hope there's a good foundation of solid people, been in the way for a while, matured in their faith. That's what we build on. That's why Jesus told Peter and James they were the pillars and grounds of truth in the early days of the church. But can I say here uh, this, this evening or this morning, excuse me, uh, that you and I have got to be careful that while there should be a mature, solid base of foundation, there should also be a healthy mix in our assembly of those who just got caught and those who ain't been caught yet. I ain't never cared about what a visiting preacher would think when he walked in the building. That whether or not he saw everybody looking like a cookie-cutter Christian. I ain't want a, Christian, a church full of cookie-cutter Christians. I want people that have been safe for a long time ought to have it down pat. Some just got caught, man. They're learning the ropes. Some ain't been caught yet, but feel like, hey, at least when I'm here, I'm loved. Hey, Amen. And as a pastor, that's when I'm most pleased, whenever there's evidence of diversity in the church. Don't worry about it. You ain't got to get nervous. God understands whenever these folks in the midst, amen, like that, and he's glad they're here. Amen. 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 It means we're making progress and not stagnating as a body of believers. Amen. I personally wish God would give us every drunk in the county. Amen. Every drug addict. Right here on these pews. I want them right here. Ever busted home. Everybody that got up this morning from a fornicator's bed, put them right here on these pews. That's where I want them at, right here. You know why? Because that pleases God. Jesus didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And that's what you and I ought to be real, real aware of in our lives. And then if we go from the plea for the invitation and the people of the invitation to the propriety of the invitation, and that is just the reason. Watch what he says in verse 1. He says, the reason that he is beseeching us, and the brethren, is because of the mercies of God. And can I say this morning, that is the reason every one of us should be willing to wave that white flag. We should participate because of the mercies, quote unquote, of God. You say, what is that a reference to? A re the, the mercies of God is a reference to what we have gained from our interaction with the grace of God. The mercies of God is the reason this morning, if you're here and you're saved, you're saved because of mercy. If he saved you, he changed your course in life. That's by mercy. Not only did he do that, but listen, because of those two things, you'll have a different outcome. Have you ever stopped to consider this morning where you may be right now had God not saved you? My life would look drastically different had I not had an interaction with the mercy of God. I am what I am today because of the grace of God, and I owe him everything. And for him to ask me to wave the white flag is a small token of, of what I really owe him. For. And listen, he's not asking me to pay him. Salvation came by grace. It's a free gift. It's mine. I couldn't lose it even if I wanted to. So what God is saying to me is this. Since you are mine and I am yours, I've given you eternal life. I've forgiven you of all your sins. I have a request. My request for you, child of mine, is that you'd wave that white flag. That you would allow me to do in you and through you what would bring me the most pleasure and glory. Make no mistake about it. Paul said over in Romans 2 verse 4, Romans chapter 2 verse earlier in the book, he said this, that it was the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. I, I didn't repent because, though I could have, I didn't repent because of judgment. I repented because God loved on me. I repented, but judgment was real. It was right around the corner. I was, I was, I was deserving of judgment, but I repented because of the, And I want to say this, I'm still repenting today because of the goodness of God. God just didn't, his goodness didn't stop at salvation, really. I just realized that at salvation, it's still been going on. God's been good to this old boy. And because of that, I would be just a reb rebellious kid. I mean, I'd be a snot-nosed brat as a child of God to take the white flag out of the air and quit waving it of surrender and say, well, thank you for salvation. Now I'm going to go do me, and I'll see you at the judgment. That would be a very sorry excuse for a child to do something like that. That moves us into in our text. Now, here's the question we're going to ask and answer this morning then. If waving the white flag of surrender is what God wants, then what is the process of waving the white uh, flag of surrender all about? You ready? Look there in verse number one. I'm going to give you four, five, six, seven, eight, twenty-five things. We'll be done eating pizza here before you know it, all right? The first thing I find is what I call the presentation that takes place in verse number one. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, and here's the presentation, that ye present your bodies. 
Paul's plea, listen now, in the first part of this book is that there would be a presentation to God by you, by me, an individual of ourselves. You know what that speaks of? That speaks of something that is done voluntarily. Very important you understand this this morning because a lot of people want to mess their life up and take their own decisions in their own hands and do them for a while. They want God to come rescue them all the time. Well, I'll say this. If we just wave the white flag, God won't need to rescue us much. But it is voluntary. You're not God, God's not going to drag you kicking and screaming. Understand this. He's not going to force anybody to, to uh, participate in what these verses are instructing on. In the Old Testament economy, God did not take offerings. People gave them willingly. God laid out a criteria of what offerings should be brought on what grounds and what terms and what seasons. And then it was up to man to participate in bringing those offerings to God. Hey, l listen to me this morning. It's not a robbery. It's not a hijacking. You can sit here today, hear everything I got, and some of you will. You'll hear everything I got to say. It'll roll like water off a duck's back through your ears. You'll do nothing with it. Now, I won't give an account for none of it. The only account I give is whether or not I give you the truth. My reward is safe and secure, not on your reaction, but on my delivery. Hey, if you do something with it, for the ones that do do something with it, boy, you're going to benefit greatly. For those of you that don't, you'll just be another statistic. Preacher, you ought not be so bold and blunt. I ought to be blunt and bolder than I am half the time. What are you talking about? Amen. Amen. But it's not going to be a robbery or a hijacking. Here's what would happen in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, whenever a sacrificial offering was brought, it was always an animal or some kind of commodity. If it was an animal, they would actually bring them to the altar of sacrifice and they would tie them up there. And the reason they tied them up is because those animals struggled. Yeah. Even an animal knows something's wrong Man. when they see the knife come out. So, preacher, you got any Bible for that? Yeah, actually, I do. If you'll write down Psalms 118, verse 27, here's what the Word of God says. It says, God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. We went to the tabernacle a couple years ago, and we, we, had, we had replicas built of every piece of, 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 of furniture. And that, that brazen altar, if my memory serves me correctly, on each corner had a horn that was a fastened to it. And they'd bring that sacrifice up there. They'd bind their legs, all four of them with cords. They'd tie them there on that, on that brazen altar so that whenever they took its life, the blood was shed there on the altar. It was a typification of Calvary, which was to come in days in the future. But can I say this? For you and I, it's not like that. God's not going to bring us kicking and screaming. God is not going to make us do anything. This morning, you'll have to wave the white flag because God's not going to have it any other way. That's why there's a presentation. He said, present your bodies. You give yourself to God. It's a willing situation. We move from the presentation to the oblation or the sacrifice itself. Look in verse 1. He says this. You present your bodies and then he calls it a living sacrifice. What Paul here explains is exactly what the believer is asked to sign up for. Becoming a living sacrifice is what God wants from us. But the question is this morning, what does that mean? I want you to mark your place in Romans 12. Go with me to Matthew 16 because this is actually a very commonly taught principle in the Scripture. This thing of being a living sacrifice sacrifice commonly taught in the word of god and it's very important that we understand it because it what jesus taught in the gospels connects back to what paul is preaching and teaching here in the scriptures themselves matthew chapter 16 when you get there say amen look in verse number 24 jesus said this then said jesus unto his disciples if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, if you want to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to deny yourself first. That means you're going to have to say no to your will. I mean, sometimes you want to do something the Bible says no to. you got to say no to that now. And then you got to say no to your wants because between your wants and your will, they'll always take you away from God when it comes to your flesh. You got to deny that and you got to take up your cross. Well, what's a cross? A cross is a place of death. In other words, you can't live for Christ and live for yourself. That's what he's teaching. Being a living sacrifice means every day you're going to get up with the faculties to make decisions. You're going to make a decision. Am I going to live for Christ today or am I going to live for me? And I want you to know this right here. There will be a conflict of interest in your life for the rest of your life in that arena. Live for God today or live for me. Do what God wants me to do or do what I want to do. Most people don't even consider this, but the greatest idol in our lives is us. Yeah. 
When we think of idol worship, we think of totem poles and statues. We think of Hinduism. We think of things like that. But honestly, the greatest idol you'll ever say no to is yourself. We love ourselves. We live to please ourselves. We're growing up in and around a culture that tells you to look out for number one. It's all about you. Selfie. We build our brands. We champion our lives. It's about me, me, me. And I ain't, I ain't picking on everybody that takes a selfie. Don't, I have to, all y'all be mad at me by the end of the day. And it's possible probably to have a selfie and not worship yourself, but I'm just saying, when Paul told Timothy that in the last days men will be lovers of their own selves, yes. I'm not saying we're there yet, but man, we've got to be making good traction heading in that direction. All right? And so there's an oblation. Now look into the next verse, verse 25. Here's what he says. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What's he talking about? Well, the previous verse tells you the light of truth that he's discussing here. Basically, what he's saying is this, that if you decide not to take up your cross and deny yourself and follow him, you're going to lose your life or you're going to waste it. He said, however, but if you'll do what I told you to do, follow me and then take up your cross and die to yourself daily there. He said, you will find your life or you will invest your life in something with eternal value. Verse 26, he gives us an exhortation. What And for what is a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, here's what he's saying. You're going to live eternity. You're going to live the rest of your eternity somewhere at Merhel. And this life's short. Appears for a little time and vanishes away. Man, we're, I mean, we pick on, we pick about our age a lot and this, that, and the other. But man, I mean, it's November. Tomorrow will be November the 1st, right? Of 2021. I mean, we just, it was January yesterday. It'll be January again for, you know, another year just boom, flew by. And so he said, hey, there's a, there is a, there is a cost involved. You know, in Philippians 121, here's what the Apostle Paul said about it. He said, for me to live is Christ, die is gain. He would even say later that dying was far better. He said, but why, while I'm here, if I'm here, while I'm here, I'm going to live for God. Amen. He was a man that had to keep the, the flag of surrender in the air. All the, that white flag had to be waved at all times, all right? Now listen to me this evening. Paul later would express the frequency of how often the dying had to take place. Over in the book of 1 Corinthians 15, 31, he made this statement. He said, I die daily. That's why you can never afford to take the flag down off the pole. The day you lower it to half mast or take it down for a cleaning is going to be the day you decide to do you. And if doing you is apart from what the Bible's teaching, there'll be consequences for it. It'll be something later that you end up paying for or getting in trouble for. And so he teaches you and I that presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice is not a one-time, once-and-for-all gesture. This morning after Brother Mason's message, I hope that we all either on the altar or in our pew waved the white flag and said, Lord, I'm going to surrender today. But can I tell you this? You have to do it tomorrow. You have to do it again the next day. You have to do it again the next day. Why? Because the flesh is so selfish, it'll never give up. It hates the idea of being crucified. We actually have examples of that. You're in Matthew still, right? Turn over to chapter 27. We can actually see from the example set at the, at the uh, crucifixion of Christ just how fleshless, excuse fleshless, how selfish the flesh is. Tongue tied this morning. When you get to Matthew 27, say amen. amen. Matthew 27, 38, the Bible says this. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, another on the left. Now watch in verse 39 the reaction of those watching the crucifixion. They that passed by reviled him, means to mock at him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. In other words, come off the cross. If thou be the Son of God, they said, come down. Can I say this? Other people are going to look at you living a... A, a life where you're a life of surrender as you let God mold you and shape you draw some lines around some dangerous areas things you stay away from. they're going to look at you and wag their head they're going to revile you mock at you and the plea is always going to be you ain't got to live like that if you're a Christian you say you ain't got to do that you can go here God don't care we're saved by grace why does it matter I'll say this if Jesus wouldn't have wanted to be on the cross he wouldn't have been on the cross 
He was up there because of his love for you and I. He was there hanging there. The Bible says no man took his life. He laid it down willingly. And can I say this? That's the only way you become a, become a, a sacrifice in that regard. And the only way you'll stay there is because you want to be there. Ever since I got saved, people have wagged their head at the decisions that, or the things that have happened in my life as God changed me. As I lived out these two verses, I've watched them wag their heads. I've, watched, I've listened to them revile. Oh, he's a legalist. You ain't got to do that to be saved. I ain't doing none of it to be saved. I do it because I am saved. I'm doing it because I'm waving the flag saying, you know better than I know with my life, God. You do what you want to with it. It's yours anyway. Now watch what happens in the next verse, verse 42. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 41. Likewise, also the chief priests. Don't read past that. That's the religious crowd. Notice what they were doing, mocking him. <laughs> and they do. Can I stop and say this right here? I don't get a lot of flack from, from those outside the church. I don't get a lot of flack from those who are out of their minds with drugs. All my, all my flack, all my Christian lives come from those inside the, the, the circle of religion. <laughs> the chief priest, and, and what, the, the mocking him and the scribe and the elder said, verse 42, he saved others, he cannot save himself. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross. Ain't it amazing? All the fleshly cries from the foot of the cross was this. Come down. Stop this nonsense. This is unnecessary. If you're really God's son, why do you have to die? You ain't got to do it. Prove to us who you are. But here's what you and I know. In this scene, Jesus was in the middle of the Father's will. He had waved the white flag of surrender because back in the garden, he had made this plea to his Father. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, that nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Yes. Do you really think that God is going to ask you or I or allow you and I to live our life in this, in, on this side of eternity and never ask something extremely hard of you? That's ridiculous. Because he asked something real hard of his son. And what was his son's response? If there's another way, can we do it that way? But if there's not, it's okay. Whatever your will is, Father, that's what we'll do. Today's Christianity, you know what we want? We want easy street. Yeah. We'll serve God up to that little marker in the road where it gets a, just a little bit hard. And that's whenever we take the flag down off the pole and say, you know what, I bet you there's somewhere else we can go church where they won't ask that stuff of you. Amen. Amen. I, 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 maybe, maybe that's what the problem is. Maybe it's just the preaching. Maybe it's the church, whatever. I'm going to say this. Anywhere you go, you can run, but you can't hide. You can't hide from truth now, all right? You can either you can either look at truth while you've got a chance here, let God do something in your life, or you can stand one day at the judgment seat of Christ whenever this truth is what we're judged out of and by. We move back to Romans chapter 12. We've seen the presentation and the oblation, but in verse 1 we also see in Romans 12 one the stipulation. Now he's asking us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, but he, there is a way he wants it presented. Just any old way won't do. Notice what he said there in your text. One word, holy. What we offer to him deserves to be holy because he desires for it to be holy. In the Old Testament economy, God made it very clear what he wanted them to bring to the temple. He set a criteria for offerings. It had to pass muster. As a matter of fact, if you were to go back and read the Old Testament, you'd find out this about sacrifices. God told them when it comes to your, your crops, on your herds, I want your first fruits. When God asked that of them, he asked that in that manner, in my opinion, because they had no clue what that would be. In other words, whenever the crops sprung forth and he said, I want the first fruits, it meant, man, if it's a bumper crop here, you knew for whatever come out of the ground what you got to bring. If it was your herds, and next thing you know, man, your herds are dropping young, and those young are, I'm talking about blemishless. I mean, good-looking stock. It'd be so easy for the natural man to say, well, I'll give God the next one, right? God said, no, it don't work that way. Not only did he want the first fruits of all your increase, but he also said, now listen, after you've given the first fruits, if you go to give again, I need you to go inspect the offering. Don't bring me, in other words, say you're a sheep herder and you got 12 little ewe lambs out there and they... That, you know, 11 of them look real good. And you got that runt in the, in the crowd, and he's kind of walked with a limp. He's got a bad eye. It'd be real easy to, like, say, you know, that one's worth less at the market. I go give him to Jesus. Yeah. Take him down there. I showed up with my offering, Lord. And, yeah, you did, didn't you? You think a lot of me, don't you, son? 
you, had, you, got, you got 12 in the herd and 11 of them is just fine as fine could be and you brought me that one we wouldn't even bring about half the value at the market, didn't you? Now, I'm going to prove to you now. You know I'm going to prove to you what I'm preaching, right? Go to Malachi chapter 1. Go to Matthew, just turn backwards one book. That's the cheap version, all right? I hope you get there. It's one of them little bitty books, four chapters, so it's hard to find. But go to Matthew and, and turn left in your Bible. Go slow now when you turn left because you'll run right past the road. you ever do that sometimes? I want you to see this with your eyes. That way you can say, man, that, that boy right there, he preached the book, don't he? He sure does. You ready? Malachi chapter 1, did you get there? Malachi chapter 1. All right, look in verse 6. We're going to read slow here because I can't, I can't fly by it now. You ready? He said, a son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If I then be a father, this is God talking to the nation, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? saith the Lord of hosts unto you. O priest, he's addressing the religious hierarchy, that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Just typical humanity. God lays out the charge. Where the, what did we do wrong? What did we do so bad? You know, like God was like wrong, like he had addressed the wrong crowd. Like when he was dressing Israel, he should have been addressing like, you know, the Assyrians or something, right? Look in verse number seven. He says, all right, you asked, I'm going to tell you what you did. Ye offer, here's the accusation, polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is content. In other words, when it's time to make a bread offering, they brought moldy bread, polluted bread, bread they couldn't eat nor sell. Next verse, verse 8. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, this is an animal, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, he says this. He said, you're bringing stuff to me you wouldn't give to the political figures of the, of the land. You know why you wouldn't give it to the political figures of the lands? Because you have to face them right there. And they're going to embarrass and shame you. He said, here's where you're messing up. One day you're going to face me, but since you're not facing me down, you're bringing me less than average or subpar offerings and you're, you're pushing that judgment down the line of peace. Can I say this? There's an ideology today that God is so desperate for followers that he don't care about the what or the how and what we offer as long as we offer. Y'all hear stuff like this sometimes. Well, you know, honey, God don't mind where you go to church as long as you go to church. Yeah, tell it. Ain't nothing farther from the truth. Amen. Do you think it don't matter to God with a book full of sound doctrine whether or not you go to a church that's got sound doctrine? Amen. Do you think it matters whether or not you go to a church where they teach salvation by grace through faith or whether they teach water baptism for salvation? You really think it don't matter? Oh, it matters. It matters where we go. It matters what we believe. It matters how we live. Oh, God don't care, honey. As long as, you, as long as your Facebook profile says you're a Christian, that's all God really cared about. You better find a scripture and verse for that. You'll search long, uh, far and wide and not find one. Amen. It so matters where you go to church that every New Testament Christian ought to make it a top priority of their life. Yes, Ask Lot this morning if location matters. Yes. <laughs> Lot made a bad decision and settled for what was financially prosperous over what was spiritually healthy and generations of his family paid the price. Oh, it matters. Oh, it matters a lot to God. We act like God is some struggling political candidate barely hanging on in the primaries and as long as we'll vote for him, he don't really care about anything else. That's a lie, friend. Go back to Romans chapter 12. i got to get out of here. Y'all's pizza is going to be cold before you get to it. So there's a presentation in this text. There's an oblation. There's a stipulation. And then there's an affirmation in verse 1 and 2. Watch this of Romans 12. In the latter part, after he mentions that that sacrifice should be holy, he tells us this. It's acceptable unto God. Latter part of verse number 2. Watch this. Last about six, seven words. He says that whenever we do this, it's good acceptable and perfect will of God. Not only does God accept this, but God desires this. It's one of those issues, as I said earlier, falls in the will of God for everybody's life. Listen, it's not, well, that's good for them. I'm tickled for them. Good for y'all. Y'all going on down. Good for y'all. Y'all fanatics. Good. I'm going to do me. Well, that's fine. But nobody should follow you. Don't talk to anybody about not waving the flag of surrender in their life if you're not going to wave it in yours. Just, li just Listen, dry up and die by yourself. 
I understand we live in a very uh, a culture very weak in their constitution and they need somebody to be like them and to pat them on the back. But look, if you're going to spiritually deteriorate into nothingness, do it alone. Man, don't take nobody with you. Now for everybody listening to my voice this morning, everybody around you are going to try to take you with them. That's why they tell you whenever they disagree with this and disagree with that and don't like so-and-so. They're trying to get you to agree with them. You are a fool if you agree with somebody going contrary to the Bible. Amen. If you've been justified, listen to me now. God is communicating to us clearly and without exception. I want you to wave the flag. Affirmation. Now look in verse number one at the adoration. Brother Mason hit on this lightly. I just want to touch on it just a little bit myself. At the end of verse number one, he calls this, this request our reasonable service. That word service means worship. Now listen to me. So God is telling you and I that there is a beseeching that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Here's what God is saying to us. When you do that, I see it as an act of worship. It's an act of adoration. Let me ask you parents something. I'll put it on an illustrative level that you and I could all grab it. You ready? You love your children, don't you? I do. Our love's unconditional, isn't it? It is. We love them regardless. When they do right, does it please you better than when they do wrong? You know it does. Don't act like it don't. It pleases your heart. You feel, re you feel respected and you feel loved and even adored when your child, without any reservation, gives you obedience. If you say no, you're a liar. I'm just telling you right now. I didn't say it behind your back, though. I said it right here in front of everybody. And the Lord was listening when I said it, okay? Now let me ask you a question. Then what about our what about our father? Are we his children? Yes. Then here's what he just said to us. I'm asking you to wave the white flag. I'm let, I'm asking you to let me call the shots. And when you do, it's an act of worship. What you're communicating to me is your adoration for me. So next time God asks something of us that's hard, and our flesh stutters a little bit along the way. Just remember on the back side of that, that decision is going to communicate something to God. It's either going to communicate worship or it's going to communicate you're not worthy. Now let me ask you a question. We talk about worshiping God. You know, oh, by the way, you don't need music to do that. You can. Music can be an instrument used to worship God. But I can worship God without uttering a word. I worship God every day of my life or choose not to based on whether or not I surrender to truth or not. From the adoration, we move on to the last verse, and I'm going to be quick here, to what I call the opposition. Now listen closely. Everything in verse 1 now has an addendum in, in verse 2. In other words, what happened? He's going to explain to us in a minute that this isn't going to be easy. There's going to be some adversaries to it. There's an opposition to you successfully waving the white flag. And watch what he says in verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Two things, and I'm finished. You ready? When it comes to opposition, first of all, you and I have to refuse confirmation. Refuse to conform. What, what's what he said in the first part of verse 2? Be not conformed to this world. That word conform simply means to fashion alike. Can I say this this morning? Everybody in this building right now is being conformed to something. You're either being conformed to the culture or you're being conformed to Christ. Now, you can know which one of the two lights your fire matters to you by which one you're looking to affirm what you're doing. If you're going to conform to Christ, then the only affirmation you need is what thus saith the Lord. If God's word says it, I'm going to do it, I don't care if anybody else approves of it or signs off on it or not. However, and this is where too many of God's children rest at or land. If you're being conformed by the culture, it matters what other people think about what you're doing. You need approval. Without their approval, you can't hardly make it. You can't survive. You'll go into a cocoon. You'll barely make it unless my parents, listen now, or my friends or my coworkers or my community. I need the approval of other people regardless of whether or not God approves. That's a, that's, a, that's a fast track to be conformed to the world. Be not conformed. That's a, that's, that, that's a statement. That is a, that is a command. And that exhortation right there means it. For most of us, listen, that's the state he found us in was conformed to the world. 
For most of us, I can say this for myself, and you know what he desires to do, exactly what Brother Mason said this morning. When he found you and I conformed to the world, his desire for us is metamorphosis. Over in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when it says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There is, no, there is nobody that gets left out of that equation, by the way. If you get saved, you become new. But that's not the end of the verse. Here's what he says. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. September the 6th, 1998, I got saved. Now can I tell you this, y'all? I didn't drive in the church parking lot that morning listening to gospel music. But it didn't take long after driving out that God started dealing with me about what I was listening to. And, he, and here's why, here's why. If we're supposed to speak to ourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, what we listen to is supposed to be able to keep us in a, in a state of worship. Yes. It's supposed to help aid our spiritual walk. And y'all know, y'all have heard me talk about the, that Chattahoochee song I used to listen to when I was lost. <laughs> and it wasn't a revival meeting they were going to. And, and, the, and the, the beverages they were drinking uh, were not the kind we would drink today at the pizza party, okay? It's just not, not, not what we're doing. And so no need for me to ride around with the window down, you know, singing that song and then come here and try to sing Amazing Grace. It's just a clash, like water and oil. Now, I lived 21 years of my life, and that's all I was tapped into. So can I tell you this? There's still a draw there now. I've been saved like 23 years, and I can still hear it. I can go to a restaurant, sit down and hear it, and I can still, it's weird. I can't, sometimes I can't remember a hymn. But I can, I, can, I can hear the first three words and the, and the melody yes. and start singing it in my head. Right. And I'm like, man, I thought that was dead and gone. Oh, no, she's alive. Yes. She will be alive until you take your dying breath. Yes. But you know what God shortly asked him? That, that's got to go, Mike. That, that's got to go. That's got to go. I need to, repl I need to replace that. Remove and replace. Yes. I did, not, I did not have to, to run my friends off. I just started talking about Jesus a lot and, and witnessing to them. And, and I kind of noticed they kind of started, I started separating. Yes. Oh, Mike's all right and everything, but I believe the old boy flipped his lid. Yeah. <laughs> he drunk some kind of religious drink, and now he's going off the deep end. And most of the time they say stuff like that, just, it, it's a phase. Give it a while. It'll, it, it'll, it'll be over. Yeah. Well, the phase has lasted 20-some years now. Yeah. I don't think this one's going to end. <laughs> Because what they call a phase, amen, is actually a new birth. But listen, now listen. Them old things, they, they're still passing. It's a lifelong process. And God's still getting rid of them little by little. And as he gets rid of them, see, some of them old things were things like my temper, my unforgiving spirit and bad attitude. He's still breaking that stuff out of me today. And every time he deals with me, I got one or two, 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 I got one or two decisions I can make. I can make an excuse for it. Or I can wave the white flag. He said, I want you to refuse confirmation. And when we resist it, listen now, we desire, listen, we deny God his desire for us, which is to be conformed, and we rob him of the glory he would get from it. We're the salt of the earth, light of the world. And the only way they ever become that in its maximum capacity is wave the white flag. Now, for us to resist that, that's a fine how do you do. You, tell, you give to somebody who just saved you from hell, ain't it? So we refuse confirmation in verse 2. I'm, I'm done right here. After you refuse confirmation or being conformed to the world, then you embrace transformation. Here's what he says happens. Verse 2, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Can I just stop and call time out and say this? That renewing of the mind takes place when you get saved, the Holy Ghost moves in, and the Spirit of God enlightens you to truth. If the Spirit of God is not there, what this Bible will ask of you will seem overbearing. What God will ask of you if you're not saved will seem hard and legalistic. But if your mind is renewed, you got a whole different outlook on it. The Bible teaches you and I that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. If someone who was lost heard some of the preaching that's done in pulpits around America, 
or when they do, it's crazy. What do you mean? Go to church that much and then you want me to go out there and work my job and give and to play? And then y'all want to give do missions and then you want me to give up some of my time and serve? And goodness, man. I just want to go to heaven when I die. To a natural mind, it's overwhelming, overbearing. But to somebody who's been born again, and that, that mind gets renewed, trust me. Listen to me now. Do you know what the word renew means? That word renew means renovation. It means God comes in and, and makes everything brand new between your ears, all right? And I want to say this, and I'll be done preaching. As your pastor, I will never desire, nor will it be my decision to preach what pleases the congregation or draws the crowd. I want to preach the word faithfully. I want to preach the word rightly divided. And here's why. Because to a congregation of believers with renewed minds, that's what changes them for God's glory and for their benefit. I understood when I signed up and accepted the call that that was the reason that you're going to live a life of rejection. A lot of people will reject you over this. And they can't help it. Because when they're natural and their mind's never been renewed, everything this book says is in opposition to what they want. But when somebody's born again, this is their hope. It's food for their soul. And as they wave the white flag of surrender... They, they're on the wheel of that master, that, that, that master potter. And he's molding and shaping their life and bringing glory to himself while he does it. Amen. And the more he does that, the lost world around us has got to take notice of what God's doing yes, in you, through you, and for you. Do you realize this? And I'm done right here. I'm, I promise. You and I are the only Bible most people ever read. That's what Paul meant when he said, you're our epistles, written, read, and known of all men. Now listen, for an unsurrendered child of God, the world's getting a perversion of the, of the book. Can you imagine what would happen right now? You, I mean, there would be a gasp in the building if I were to rip out the book of Romans. Mm, throw it on the ground. Rip out the book of Genesis. Throw it on the ground. I mean, some of y'all get up and walk out. That preacher's a heretic. You know, you should rightfully so. That's fine. I wouldn't have a problem with that. But hang on a second. What about whenever we say, I ain't listening to that? If he preaches that, I'm out. I'm gone. No way. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. I ain't here. I ain't changing there. You forget that. Ain't happening, boy. I go somewhere where they won't preach on that stuff. Don't look now, but your flag's lowered. Don't look now, but you've took your flag to half mast. Don't look now, but don't look now, but your flag's been ripped off the pole. I'm gonna tell you what every born again child of God or the walking house got every time say, hey, give me the book, preacher. I just, I've been praying for you. Just give me the book. If it's amen or old me, just give me the book. Oh, bring the book. Preach the book, preacher. And I realized before I walked in the door, there's a good chance that I may have something come up tonight in the message, but I may have to wave the white flag on and surrender about it, okay? But I didn't come. I didn't come to fight him. I come to worship him. You realize right here, I mean, in like five to seven seconds, you're getting a chance to worship here in a minute. And it's all about whether that flag shoots up the pole or whether it comes back down. Waving the white flag of surrender. Every head bowed, every eye closed. There's only one response to a message like that with the air in your life, and the response is.